Hello, I'm Robin Francis, and for the past 17 years, I've been growing my own food in my own backyard organically. Increasingly, people are becoming concerned about the quality of their food, especially fruit and vegetables, because a high level of chemicals, pesticides, fungicides and so on are being used in vegetables and they are not being carefully monitored. The adverse effects of these are becoming very well known and people are looking for solutions. The best solution to clean food is to grow it in your own backyard because you know what you've grown and um, exactly what you've put into it. The idea of gardening though puts a lot of people off. Uh, particularly when they look at traditional methods of gardening, digging and weeding, becoming a slave to the garden every weekend is not many people's idea of fun. So permaculture has solved all those problems and we'll be showing you how you can construct your productive edible landscape in your own backyard and it won't be much maintenance at all and it will produce extremely well over the years. This garden here has just suffered six weeks of neglect while I've been overseas teaching permaculture courses and there aren't too many gardens that you could come back to and still find an abundance of food waiting for you, ready to eat. This is a fairly typical suburban scene throughout most of Australia. We're very fortunate here in that we do have a backyard large enough to grow most of our own food. With permaculture and good design, good gardening techniques, we can be fairly self-sufficient in an average suburban block. Actually, a quarter acre block can produce most of the food needs for a four-person family and even a surplus. We don't need to dig either. Most people are turned off the idea of gardening because they think the rest of their recreational life is going to be spent with backbreaking work, digging and hoeing and weeding. But we're going to demonstrate just how much food can be grown on a very small space, eliminating most of that arduous work. Of course, most of the work is going to be involved in setting it up. If we set up our garden properly, we're going to reduce most of our maintenance later on. If we design our garden properly and the way we put our plants together using companion planting techniques, we're going to eliminate a lot of our problems with pest and disease. Uh, we're going to start here on this site and create a nice water garden. Water is a beautiful dimension in any garden and uh, we'll be growing our Chinese water chestnuts and taros there and we'll be creating a mandala garden around this which is a very effective way of growing our food. Now, to make a tire pond, um, we can take any sort of tire, depending on the size pond we want. I've chosen a truck tire for this one, although I've made many tractor tire ponds, which are naturally so much bigger. Um, so all we need to do is dig our hole in the ground, line it with plastic, and you'll see the procedure as we go with the video. So now I'm actually positioning the tyre, putting it in place exactly where I want it in relationship to the rest of the garden and I'm marking the perimeter of the tyre with, the, um, with a few bits of string here so that I can take the tyre away and dig the hole the right size. I'm using several smaller pieces of string so that um, if I lose the position of one while I'm digging I still have the others in place and dig the hole the right size, just slightly larger than the tyre itself. And I'll finish preparing the tyre, which means we simply cut the middle out of the tyre, so we've got a larger water surface area up the top here. And I find it's easiest to do with an ordinary kitchen knife. Um, it's a bit of work getting the knife in, but once you've got it in, it works all right, and I find a serrated knife works best. You can use it like a small saw. Now we don't need this. You can put that away. And we're going to roll the tyre out of the way and dig our hole. Just chipping the grass here to make it easier to get in with the shovel. The only thing I use a spade for in a garden 
is digging holes for tire ponds and digging holes for plant trees. Other than that, I don't have any use for spade because I don't dig my gardens. So we've finished the outside. Now I'm doing a circle around the inside, just um, sort of a, a spade's width away from the outside one. The same thing, just letting the um, my body weight do the work. And as you can see, we can lift it up very easily. It's quite difficult if you try to dig things out further from this side, you're working away forever. And you can do damage to your back that way. Pop it up into little bits. And it's quite easy now to get in with the fingers and lift it out and move it away. So I'm just going to put the tire in there. You can see that the hole has been finished around the edges, but I just want to test, test the depth of it. And um, we don't need to make that much deeper. It's a bit higher on this side than it is that side, so I've just got to take a little bit more soil out of here so that it, um, it sits down level. And we make sure there's no sharp stones or sharp roots sticking up that might puncture the plastic. I'll just even this out a bit now. So oh, if you're doing one with a tractor tyre, you'll need two people. But a tyre of this size, you can handle alone. OK, we're right now. Uh, there's no sharp stones or rocks in the bottom. The hole is the right depth. So now we can simply put our plastic in and um, put the tyre in, fill it up, fix up the edge, and she'll be finished. OK, this is the um, plastic we're using. It's just a heavy-duty clear plastic. Pop the tyre in and it's ready to fill. But before we fill it, we'll just do our finishing off. We're going to tuck the plastic in. See, the water level is determined by the height of the plastic. So we want the plastic to wrap around the tyre and we'll be putting sandstone flagging around here to hold the plastic in place and to give the tire pond a nice edge. Before we put our edging on we need to fill in this space around here, firm it down properly, that's why I kept some soil here nice and handy. Uh, so I can pack that in and as I pack that in I'm going to put some newspaper around here so the weeds don't go growing up uh, next to the pond. We need to wet the newspaper before we use it. Uh, if you're trying to work with dry newspaper, it's a real hassle. Uh, if the wind blows, it starts flapping all over the place. It's difficult to position it. Also, it's a lot more brittle when it's wet and you'll get little cracks and crevices that the weeds can pop up through. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting the, tucking the newspaper in and folding that over and then packing the dirt in here because there's weed seeds and uh, cooch roots in the, um, in the soil here that I'm tucking in. I don't want them to grow. And newspaper makes a wonderful weed barrier. If I tuck the newspaper in first, you'll notice that I use it very thick. Uh, this one we can cut in half because we're working in a circle here. We need to overlap it well. So we overlap it three or four inches each piece. Uh, this one we can cut in half because we're working... Certainly easier than many years of weeding. We'll pack this dirt in now and um, that'll hold the tire pond in position. We'll make a little path around this later on and employ the same technique under the path to eliminate the weeds. Now this is definitely a hand job. Don't go using the shovel or a crowbar or a stick to pack the earth down because you might perforate plastic. It's not going to hold water with holes in it. So 
we pack that into uh, ground level. So we're going to lay this newspaper down now and uh, so it's going to stop our weeds from growing up and we'll be overlapping more newspaper here later on to make the path and then the garden beds. So that goes quite fast, down in no time. And now we're going to trim the plastic in line with the edge of the tyre. This is going to be a bit of a job. It's a lot easier with a with thicker plastic and a single sheet. You've just got to chew through it a bit more when you're using more than one sheet of plastic. So it folds every now and then, so you've got quite a few thicknesses to get through. But just keep pulling it straight and tight, and uh, it's easy enough. Now it's important to keep pulling it out and make sure you're in line with the edge. And we'll need to go back afterwards because there will be a few ragged bits we don't want them showing. Now we're going to put some fine sand on top of the plastic to protect it, just in case something falls in there and um, might perforate it. Also, it's going to protect the plastic from deteriorating uh, from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. They'll degrade the plastic with time, so we want to keep all the plastic away from sunlight. So, two or three inches of this sand and notice it's clean white sand so we don't have um, murky water in the pond. It will settle down in about a day. Tap it down well. So now we can put the water in and while it's filling up we can put the edging around the um, top of the, the pond. But you'll notice I've got the hose on very low so we don't want to stir the stuff up too much and I'm just lying it very neatly in the edge of the tyre, lying it in the tyre, not in the centre. If I lie it in the centre, it'll start to wash up all the sand. Now we're going to put these sandstone blocks down to give it a nice finish. It's very easy to do. It's um, kids play. It's like a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, finding the pieces that fit, where and how they fit best. So uh, get yourself a good variety of sizes. This will be a bit fiddly, but uh, it's fun to do. And uh, they're fairly readily available from landscaping suppliers. This is about $10 worth here, so it's not uh, enormously expensive. Uh, while the water's filling up, we can plant the pond. I prefer to put my plants in in the seven inch black pots because it's a lot easier to take them out for harvesting. This one is a taro. The um, roots of that are a vegetable, a starch vegetable, a bit like potato. It's found right throughout the Pacific Islands where it's a staple food. And these leaves will get quite large. Uh, they look good and they're good to eat. So we'll just nestle that in here. And what we have to go with the taro is some Chinese water chestnuts. Now this is the root of the Chinese water chestnut, the part that we use. I'll just wash it. This is the part we eat and it's also the part we plant. A bit like potatoes, growing potatoes. You put that in the, uh, in the soil and um, it grows. And after eight months or so of growing, or if you're in a frosty area, when the tops die back, you harvest the roots, keep some for planting next year, and eat the rest. Now you see there's the flesh inside. It's very tasty. Uh, it's crunchy and juicy, a bit like coconut, but far superior. If you've eaten uh, Chinese water chestnuts from the can, and you try the fresh ones, you'll never touch a can again. You can peel them or you can eat them straight as they are. What about the mosquitoes, you might be saying? Well, yes, mosquitoes are going to breed in any water they find lying around. But in about two weeks' time, when the water's settled down, 
we can put some goldfish in there or some native rainbow fish and they'll take care of the mosquito wrigglers very well. Because there'll be such an abundance of food in here, we'll get small tuberfex worms growing in the potting mix. And the mosquitoes that try to breed in here, there will be a good supply of food for our little fish. And uh, for one or two goldfish, we should never need to give them any additional feed. So this is finished now, and we're going to make the pathway around the pond which will give us access to our garden beds and to do that first we're going to soak our newspaper so it's wet lie it down to stop the weeds from growing up and we'll be covering that with a layer of bagasse and pebbles so we've got a nice durable pathway just make sure there's no colored paper in there stuff like this we don't want uh, there's a lot of toxic chemicals used in the colour ink. So any coloured paper we're going to put aside and just use ordinary newsprint. So we'll give it a good soak so it's nice and wet. Have the most informed or misinformed earthworms in town by the time they've chewed through this. So now we're going to put this newspaper down. It's nice and wet, it's been well soaked. The only mistake you can make with this is not overlapping it well enough or not having uh, sufficient thickness of newspaper. We want our newspaper thickness as well as thick as possible so we can stop the cooch, the kaikuyu and the weeds from growing up underneath. Um, also, the weed seeds that are in the soil here won't be able to germinate because we're excluding the sunlight from them. So with these gardens, the only time that we should have weeds growing from down here is if we ever happen to dig the garden. And we shouldn't have a reason to do that ever. So we're overlapping it well, we're getting it nice and thick, overlapping it well with this weed barrier here. And we're going to make this one extra thick because of the pathway. It's going to suffer a bit more wear and tear. Here we've got two sections of the newspaper together. We'll use them longwise. So now we've finished our inner circle, putting the weed barrier down. And we're going to put another row around so that the weed barrier extends beyond the pathway. And we've got plenty of newspaper to overlap for the weed barrier for our garden beds. Okay, I've got a, some bagasse here and we're going to use that as the foundation of the path because if we were to put pebbles directly on the newspaper, they would wear through it. So this is creating a buffer zone and we don't need to use as many pebbles with it. It's light, it's easy to handle and it, um, it's very economic to buy. So I'm just going to shake this around while the children help to spread it. Okay, we'll tuck it in nice and neat around the edges of the, of the stones here, edging the pond, maybe a little bit in between. And it just keeps, helps to keep the uh, stones in place. So we'll just touch up this corner here and we'll increase the width just marginally so it's overlapping a bit more into the edge of the garden. And we can start working the garden with this bagasse to um, tread on so we won't be wearing through the paper. And we'll be putting the pebbles in later on. So we'll just shake a little bit out here. A little bit around here. Save some for our keyhole paths. There we are. So well, now we can start walking on this path and we're in the, a position now to start looking at actually making our garden beds. By the way, there are other things that you can use for a centrepiece for a mandala garden besides a tire pond. You might like to put in a herb spiral 
Um, you can simply have a circular garden bed, maybe with a feature fruit tree in it, like a dwarf peach, or you can make a, a banana circle. So I'll just compact this down a bit now. Don't need a roller, just a few feet. Need some music, huh? Just do, do the stomp. Okay. Well, that's firm. It's nice and thick. We won't be wearing our paper. And we can start making our keyhole beds. Now, a keyhole bed is a, a revolutionary design concept um, from permaculture. A traditional garden has beds in long rows. We have to run up and down the rows to maintain the garden and harvest your vegetables. What we do with the keyhole garden is we define our main pathway, which might be in a circle, it can be in a straight line. And instead of having long beds to run up and down and look after, we're going to wrap that long bed around our feet. So the way we plan it is we step take one step off the main path and we're going to make a little path that comes out and looks a bit like a keyhole. So we've got a round bit around our feet where we can sit down comfortably and work the garden bed around us. So the width of the garden bed will be as far as we can reach. So from this one spot I can work this whole bed. And that's the way you design and implement your keyhole bed. Don't make them too big because you're going to fall over trying to reach. Keep it small, keep it accessible. So the length of your arm is going to dictate how wide it's going to be. Not somebody else's arm, your arm. This is personalised garden design. So the pond's finished now. We've worked out how wide the path is going to be around it. Now we're going to mark the other pathways before we make the garden. So I've just uh, picked up a few remainders from the sandstone to um, mark where things are. It's very easy to lose track. Uh, the first thing is to work out where you're going to come in to your circular path. And uh, I've chosen this spot here because it's easier for me to bring the hose in here to water. And it's a straight line from the kitchen door. So I can dash out from the kitchen straight into the garden to uh, pick my parsley and so forth. So these ones here, and then I've marked the other keyhole pathways so that um, I've got that neat arm's distance either side of me where I squat as I go. So there's one here and another one here and so on around the rest of the circle. So as we did before, we start off by putting down a nice solid weed barrier, very, very thick. I think we've got a whole newspaper and a bit here. Another thick bit here, overlapping it well. These paths are going to suffer a bit of wear and tear and we don't want this breaking up for the uh, cooch to get through. Get that stone out. Now once we've got this down, we'll just lay down the, um, the gas base. So our path is defined. We don't need it very wide here, just wide enough to step. And a little circle there to stand. So from the pathway, we take our step out into our squatting circle and we'll be working the garden from around here. So we'll do each of these. We've got five keyholes around the circle. So we'll pop these down quickly and then we can fill in the newspaper in between, put the mulch on and stick the plants in. And we have one more keyhole to do and we've completed our circle. The big gas here, just um, top them up. Here, 
We're almost there, aren't we? And we're putting our weed barrier down for the garden beds now. Once again, very thick, whole newspapers overlap them very well. So we don't get that cooch creeping up in between. And we're just going to lay this down over the entire garden area now. It's a lot easier than digging up the weeds, isn't it? So we've done most of our keyholes. Uh, we'll have to finish this section off here once we've moved the compost onto the ones that are ready. I made the compost heap here on the site so that the nutrients that uh, leach from the uh, compost heap into the soil are there underneath the garden. Because eventually the earthworms are going to uh, turn this into, into compost, the newspaper, and also the roots will eventually find their way down through the newspaper. Now, the important thing, once again, is when you're lying it down, overlap it very well. Uh, give it at least six inches or more if you're dealing with kaikuyu or kooch, and um, virtually give it several layers of paper, and whole sections of newspaper, a couple of those, so that the, um, the kaikuyu or kooch will weaken. Now, sometimes it will sneak through. They're pretty... Uh, they're real survivors and occasionally you will get a bit of cooch or kaiku you coming through. If you have that problem with your garden, don't worry. Just wait until the end of your growing season and where gardeners in a normal garden would be digging and hoeing and weeding, you just lay down more newspaper and more mulch on top, on top of the kaiku you and cooch. Don't waste your try time trying to pull it out. And uh, if you keep doing that for a couple of years, usually within three years, you'll have it conquered. And uh, the best time to do it is to give it a very, very heavy mulch in winter when the grasses are naturally um, weak. It's their less vigorous time of year. So what we've got now is a series of semicircular beds around our keyholes, and they're ready to put the mulch on. So here's the compost. It's been composting here for us for a couple of weeks and it's ready to go out. So we're just going to put it straight on the newspaper and uh, try not to confuse it with the path too much. So we'll just cut forkfuls of this around and spread it out. So we want to spread this out at least six inches deep deeper if we can. Now the wonderful thing about this form of gardening, not only does it eliminate the arduous task of weeding, but you can do it on any sort of soil. We've got a very poor sandy soil here. And if you do your traditional digging the compost into the ground, it disappears in a couple of weeks. It just gets swallowed up by the sand. Whereas here, it's sitting on top. You can do this in very rocky soil, sandy soil. I've made these gardens everywhere from cold temperate Germany to um, the desert in central Australia. And they work well. Now this compost is a concoction of horse manure, uh, a bale of straw and lawn clippings. You can make compost from whatever's available. Um, I use what's called the Berkeley compost method for this sort of compost. Uh, we could use the raw materials without composting them, but uh, it's just a bit longer. It takes a, a few months until things really grow well, until the materials start breaking down. But, um, you can use any sort of manure, horse manure, cow manure, um, sheep, goat manure, uh, chicken manure you need to be careful with, only use in small amounts, it's very strong. 
And so this would be about 20%, 30% manure, and the rest is straw and lawn clippings. Now you make the initial compost heap, mix the ingredients a bit just by heaping them on the compost heap in layers, and um, turn the compost heap every three days. See what happens about eight hours after you make your compost heap, it starts to get very hot in the middle. If you make a hole in there with the handle of a rake or something, stick your hand in there the next day, it's very hot. It gets up to 60 degrees. And that burns out a lot of your weed seeds and the microorganisms, the little bacteria, uh, that help to compost, break it all down, are very busy. And within three days, they've used up all the oxygen in that heap. Um, then it becomes what we call anaerobic. There's no oxygen left, so the whole composting process slows down. So we turn the heap over, water it well, and the same thing happens again. So we do that half a dozen times, and the compost is ready to put out and plant straight into. So we've got some more newspaper, and we'll just finish off these last two keyholes put the compost down on them and we're ready to plant. We're nearly finished and uh, we'll just um, check that we've got it nice and thick right into the path edges and in the inside and um, where it's not quite thick enough we'll add a bit more. So you see it's quite thick there. You can always test the depth by putting your hand down gently to the newspaper. So we've got it about that deep. We don't want to have it much shallower than that. Um, you can't have it too deep. You can go anything up to um, 18 inches. 12 to 18 inches or half a metre of compost, you can grow wonderful vegetables even on concrete. So don't worry if you haven't got uh, a nice big backyard. You can make a little garden on top of bricks, on top of concrete, on top of rock, anything you like. So long as you've got plenty of good compost there for things to grow in. I'm just getting the, firming the edges of the compost around the garden path edge. We're just about finished now. We just want to put the pebbles on the pathway, put the plants in, and a day's work's done. Not even a full day's work. We started this morning at 8 o'clock, knocked off at 10.30 when it started to get hot. It's not very good doing a lot of outdoor work middle of the day and particularly with the um, ultraviolet rays from the sun they get very strong from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock good time to be inside we're not after suntans anymore are we and we came back out here about 4:30, 5 o'clock and um, the sun's almost gone soon the garden will be in complete shade perfect time for putting out our plants and seedlings we never want to do them in the heat of the day or in the morning I'm using pebbles because this is a very windy site. Uh, we don't have to use pebbles for a pathway. We can use sawdust. Uh, the bagasse alone would be quite good for a uh, garden path. Um, you can use bark chips too if you like. But uh, any of those lighter materials here in a windy place are going to start flying all over the place. Also, you tend to take a lot of stuff inside on your feet and you're forever cleaning the uh, kitchen floor. So I've used pebbles, two bags of pebbles, um, $7 worth, and the whole of the path has cost $10. The pond cost $10, and that was just for the, um, for the pavers. Uh, I don't think the entire garden has cost any more than $30. It's fairly economical. You can't get much cheaper than that. And uh, the plants are about that much again. And it will be producing a lot of food in a few weeks. Even the pebbles out a bit. And as I said, it's a good durable path, and with the bagasse underneath, that cushions it so the pebbles aren't wearing through the weed barrier. You can also use cardboard for a weed barrier, particularly for pathways. Um, cardboard isn't so good to use as a weed barrier for your garden beds because of the boron in it. A lot of plants don't like boron. So just finish off the edge of the garden path here and um, 
That'll stop the pebbles from rolling off into the lawn and flying around with the lawnmower. The garden doorstep. So I'm just hosing it down. There's a bit of dust in the gravel and um, it just hoses in the little bits of the gas and compost that are lying on top. So here we are, ready to plant. Our five lovely keyholes, all set up, ready to step into and put those veggies in the ground. And a garden like this isn't going to be the sort of vegetable garden that you feel ashamed of and you hide down near the back fence. It's a garden that deserves to be up front. I think there's nothing more sad than poor little rows of cabbages growing all by themselves. Uh, they look daggy, they feel daggy, and they get a lot of pests that way. Oh, the way we plant our vegetables and flowers and herbs in here will be just as exciting and revolutionary as the shape of our garden beds. And now we're going to put some seedlings in. This is uh, eggplant and capsicum, two plants that love to go grow together. Uh, there's companion planting and um, there's two basic principles with companion planting. There's pairs of plants, plants that grow well with each other and there's also what we call guilds of plants, a group of plants that all do extremely well together. So capsicum, eggplant and okras are three plants that grow well together and later on I'll be putting some okra seeds in between these ones. But uh, for the time being we've got some eggplant and uh, capsicum seedlings. Now what I'm doing is I'm making a just a little tiny hole in the mulch here just a little tiny pocket, putting a handful of potting mix in uh, with these small seedlings. It's good to have a bit of potting mix for them to put their roots into. And we've got all our little planting pockets ready to go. Now we're going to take the seedlings out of the punnet. We just put our fingers in there to support the soil, just carefully in between the stems, turn it upside down take the pot off and there they are, safe and sound, no trauma and then we gently break them apart. Just separate them. And we put the capsicums in the inner circle, one in each of these holes and the eggplants around the outside. When we plant the seedling let the roots dangle down and with your hand make a hole there in the soil. Gently lower the roots in so that the, where the roots begin is just at the top soil level. Gently bring the soil back in around and tuck it down so it's nice and firm and in a few minutes when we've got them all planted we'll water them in and they'll grow well in their new home. We're going to do another companion planting combination here. This is beans and summer savoury. Summer savoury is a delicious herb to cook with beans and people who suffer wind when they eat beans will find that putting some summer savoury with their beans not only makes them taste better but um, saves all those digestive problems. They also grow very well together. The summer savoury, or you can use winter savoury as well, uh, enhances the vigour and the insect uh, resilience of plants, of the beans, and what we have to grow with it is some bush beans. So there's our summer savoury, and we'll put another win one in on the other side and put our bean seeds around in the keyhole. This is a more established plant, so we don't need so much potting mix with it. It's got a lot already there with the roots. We'll just tuck that in. Pull the compost up around it. You notice that when I'm planting things in, it's approximately a hand span from the edge of the compost, so there's room for the root system to grow out there. Don't plant right on the edge because there's not enough compost then for the roots. Now, planting seeds um, in fairly fresh compost and fresh mulch materials like this, uh, once again, we just make small pockets and pop our seeds in. Uh, beans, you need to be able to get to them very easy to harvest, so having them around that keyhole, semicircle, is going to make it very easy to pick your beans. With seeds, um, what I do is just make a very small soil pocket, 
at the right spacing and we'll put two seeds in each of these. Just bury them down about one and a half to two centimetres. That's the right depth for bean seeds. Usually it's about two and a half times the length of the seed. Now, planting potatoes is a piece of cake. You just scratch right down, a bit like a chook, to the bottom of the compost, lie the potato on top of the paper and just pull the compost back over and there it is, your potatoes planted. No digging. Melian, pop yours in. And they'll grow well. The best potatoes grow in compost. Well, we're on to our third keyhole now, and we're going to plant another guild here, and that is tomatoes, carrots, radishes, um, calendulas, and basil. Plants that all grow extremely well together. And we're going to need to stake these, so we'll be putting some stakes in later on. These are the tiny Tim tomatoes. Now the joy with these is that not only are they prolific bearers, but they don't have any problems with fruit fly. The small cherry or tiny Tim tomatoes um, are the original variety from which all the other tomatoes have been bred, so they're very tough in terms of disease and their resistance to it. I'll put the basil in between the tomatoes. This is sweet basil here. Just ease it out of its pot. It's rather root bound this one. So we'll just um, loosen the roots up underneath and divide it in the centre. It'll be a bit of a job. But uh, it's a tough plant. It'll survive it. Basil and tomatoes is a bit like um, savoury and beans. They're plants that, or vegetables, fruits that taste really good together. And basil helps to uh, develop the disease resistance of your tomatoes. They both do much better when they're growing together. With the beans, you saw how to plant large seeds. Uh, with radishes and particularly carrots, we're dealing with small seeds. So what I'm doing down here is I'm just making a row around, just um, a small depression in the mulch. Because they're very fine seeds, we're going to need to put a little bit of potting mix in there to sow them into, otherwise they'll just get lost. And we'll dribble a bit of potting mix around in there and sprinkle a bit more on top to cover them up. Now they don't need to go in very deep at all. Now, if you've ever grown uh, carrots before, you know they're a problem to sow. It doesn't matter how thin you try to sow your carrot seeds, they're always too close together. You always have far too many seedlings coming up. Now, what I do is I get a bit of sand, or a mixture of sand and potting mix, like this. I put some carrot seeds in. They're small, very fine seeds. And then I put some radish seeds in. Cherry ones and a few of the long whites. And I just mix them together. And that way you get a nice even spread when you spread them around. So I just sprinkle that around now. Uh, radishes and carrots grow extremely well together. They're good companions, and one of the things that they do together is um, the, carrot, the radishes go down, they act as pioneers. Their roots go down, break up the soil, and they have fast-growing leaves that protect the young carrots while they're small. And now just a fine sprinkle of potting mix over the top, not too much, about a centimetre, which is just under half an inch. Pat them down. And we'll water them all in later and they'll grow. We should be harvesting the radishes in about four or five weeks. So that's the third keyhole finished. We've got two more to go and uh, our garden's done. We'll just be filling in a few of the empty patches with some herbs to uh, help control the insect pests and bring the beneficial insects in and to add fragrance and flavour to the garden.
as well as some nice flowers. So in this keyhole, um, we're putting a row of beetroots around and uh, we'll be planting some self-bunching onions with those. Ordinary onions can be a bit of a hassle. You've got to raise the seedlings, you've got to transplant your seedlings out. But um, with the self-bunching onions or shallots, you've got a constant supply of onions there on tap whenever you need them all year round, year in, year out. So here's our self-bunching onions. This clump here started from an initial single piece, just like we're going to break off now. So when you want to eat them, all you have to do is pull out one plant. There you've got your one shallot, or two or three. And if you want to grow more of them, you simply separate the individual pieces like this and plant them. As long as they've got a little bit of root on the bottom, they will grow. I just tuck them into the compost there and they'll clump up very soon. In a couple of months, they will have quite a few young side shoots and it won't be too long and I'll be able to harvest my shallots from them. So we'll be putting some salad greens in here and green herbs and uh, what's happening here is what will be happening all around the garden uh, in six months time. This coriander plant here is almost to the end of its lifetime. It's got quite a few seeds that it's setting. So I'm planting that in there so that these seeds will self-sow. I've always found my best coriander has been self-sown. And this is another plant that I'm putting in to sow its own seed. And this is a land cress. It's called upland cress. Though we find here that we've got ripe seed pods coming on. That's going to shed its seed and we'll have lots of lovely young cress plants coming up there fairly soon. And in between those, I'll be planting these salad burnets. It's a wonderful salad herb. It's got a slight cucumbery taste and very rich in minerals. You get a lot of minerals in salad burnet that you don't get in any other uh, salad green or vegetables. They're very important for health. And they taste nice too. I'm just putting in a few fragrant herbs here. They're nice for flavouring. Um, lovely smells when you're working in the garden. And you can use them for herb teas, pot puris, herbal baths. Here we've got two of the fragrant um, basils. Cinnamon basil and licorice basil. And here we have an anise hyssop. It's one of my favourites. I love the smell and it gets very beautiful purple flowers. These strong smelling fragrant herbs are very important for pest control in the garden. The smells, the perfumes of these plants confuse your pests. So they don't smell lots of tomatoes or lots of cabbages or lots of carrots to come in and feast on. And a lot of them are just generally very beneficial plants in terms of companion planting. Now this is another one of my salad favourites, French sorrel. It's got a nice um, sort of sour flavour, a lot of vitamin C in it. It's the ascorbic acid that gives it that really refreshing tang. Oh, um, I often like to graze on it while I'm working in the garden. And this will have to grow a bit before I do any heavy grazing. Another one of my favourites here is lavender. And the lavender will do well here. Quite often in uh, these more subtropical climates where we have heavy rainfall, um, it's a problem growing Mediterranean plants. They need good drainage. And you can see with a raised garden like this, there are never any drainage problems. So things will usually survive the wet season quite well. I'm back round to Keyhole 1 now. And uh, just popping in a Mitcham lavender. Now lavenders are generally excellent companion plants. Um, they're just beneficial for most other plants in the garden. They're not antagonistic towards anyone. And we have a few calendulas here. A calendula you can eat. You can eat the flower as well as the leaves. And I like to make some ointment with the flower and leaves. Calendula ointment. 
So quite simple to make. And it's a virtual first aid kit in itself for all sorts of skin ailments, cuts, sores, bruises, burns, you name it. And um, if you've been doing a lot of hard work and you've got sore feet from standing all day or doing a lot of planting like I have been today, uh, you can make a nice foot bath with calendula flowers and leaves. Now this is a plant that most people pull out of their garden as a weed. It's a dandelion. And for me, a garden isn't complete without dandelions. And if they're not already growing as weeds around, well, I make sure I get a few nice dandelion plants and get them going. I like the leaves in salads. They're very good, help keep you slim and fit. And um, once again, very important source of iron and other minerals. And after a few years, you can always harvest the root and uh, dry, cut it up, dry it, roast it, and it makes a lovely coffee substitute. An excellent liver tonic. So this, this pot is full of a couple of delights. This is Heartsease. It's a nice companion plant, and it's lovely to have flowers around in the garden. It's almost at the end of its lifespan, but it self sows. It's one of those little delights that keeps popping up in the garden all over the place. And growing in the pot with it is another one of my favourite weeds, chickweed, that uh, you'll often find growing in gardens. Not growing in this garden yet, so I'm introducing it because there's nothing nicer in salads. Some thyme, an important and essential herb for every garden. It's a common garden thyme. And some sage. I'm putting a tansy in here. Tansy is a good herb. Um, so it's a good herb to plant around fruit trees. It helps to keep the ants down and um, ants are good things to keep away from fruit trees because they'll, um, they'll encourage the aphids to come up and suck the juice out of the young fresh shoots on your fruit tree. And this is another must for every garden. This is comfrey. The leaves are quite delicious when they're young and fresh. I like them battered and fried, they're like little fishes. And a very important source of vitamin B12. So once that plant gets nice, big, well established, I can use these leaves for mulch and for a liquid fertiliser. Uh, they're a completely balanced fertiliser when they're composted. And we have a yarrow here. We'll put over in the next keyhole. And yarrow is another one of those generally beneficial herbs. Uh, all plants that grow near it benefit from it. And when you're making your compost heap, you can shred two or three leaves of yarrow into the compost heap and take a bit of the soil from around the roots of the yarrow and that will accelerate the composting time and process. It's also a good medicinal herb. If you get caught out in the wet and catch a chill, a nice cup of yarrow tea will help keep the cold at bay. Well, the garden's been growing for two months now and um, as you can see, it's grown quite a bit. It's a difficult time for gardens um, here in the north coast because this is the wet season, so a lot of our European veggies don't um, take too kindly to it. But uh, despite that, everything's growing extremely well and we're going to harvest some of the produce. They're so nice and sweet. I love tiny tin tomatoes. They're a real joy. And of course, we need a few sprigs of basil to put in with them and we might make some pesto sauce tonight. See how handy it is having everything nice and close easy to reach. It's one of the beauties of this kind of garden design. You don't have to go running up and down long straight rows of veggies. Those lettuces are starting to um, shoot up to seed but we can still use the leaves off them so we'll pick some leaves off these for, um, for a salad and we'll leave some of the slower ones to go to seed. 
The last one to go to seed, I will let actually seed into the garden. And then I'll get lettuces coming up like weeds. And I won't need to sow lettuces ever again. These uh, small mignonette lettuce are wonderful. We call them volunteers. Um, plants that will just re-sow and come up by themselves in the garden. We've got some lovely capsicums starting to form here. There's some little baby ones coming in down the bottom. So uh, we can start to harvest the odd one now. They're still a bit small. They're going to grow about that much bigger. But um, the garden will let us take a few young ones so we can enjoy the delights um, right from the start. The eggplants are starting to form now. We've got quite a few coming on. We've got one on this bush and another one over here. And uh, this one's flowering, so we're going to have a, another young one growing there very soon. So we're going to take this one. It's a bit small, but we're going to have... Um, we've got plenty more coming on. So we're going to enjoy this one tonight too. I scattered a few radish seeds around the garden a few weeks ago. Um, just broadcast them on top of the um, mulch. Now they're growing quite well and I can pull out the odd radish. They don't have to be in rows. I'll get a few sorrel leaves and we'll slice them up fine into our salad. I've got some salad burnet here and uh, that's fun to pick in the mornings because the, um, all the dew drops are gathered at the ends of each of the little serrations there. So it's really quite pretty. We've got some celery herb over here and that'll make a lovely spice in a, um, in a vegetable pot with the capsicums and um, aubergine, maybe a bit of ratatouille. And we've got some dandelion leaves for our salad. And over here we've got some uplands cress. Now this is the cress plant that I originally planted over here that was going to seed. So the mother plant has finished now, she's ready to go down as mulch. And we've got lots of young ones coming up in the garden by themselves. Another one of our favourite volunteers. Well, we've got a lovely basket of veggies here from our little garden. Um, I'm glad we're having visitors tonight to help us eat it all. You can keep it for several days in the fridge, but uh, there's nothing quite like fresh picked straight from the garden into the kitchen. So uh, what I'm doing now is giving the garden a bit of uh, liquid fertiliser. Uh, this is fish emulsion. Uh, so I usually alternate. I'll use fish emulsion for a while. I'll, I'll use liquid seaweed or kelp. And uh, once I've got some comfrey well established in the garden, I'll make my own liquid fertiliser from that. And so I do this about once a month. So this is the, be the second application that this garden has had. Liquid fertilisers like the uh, seaweed or liquid kelp are particularly good in the garden because they act as a um, preventative for a lot of fungal diseases, uh, powdery mildews and so forth. And they do help to protect the plants against some insects. Oh, uh, we haven't got an awfully thick mulch layer here and uh, being such a poor quality soil, very sandy soil, I need to concentrating, uh, concentrate on building up my mulch layer. So over the first year or so, about every three or four months, I'm going to add on mulch materials as I get them to hand. So um, I've got some partially composted lawn clippings here and um, 